Well, thank you very much, Jill. Um, and uh, thank you all for, for coming. Uh, and, and when Jill invited me to, to do this event, I went on the IFG website and took a look around at what some of the other events were uh, and saw you know, quite a number of very, uh, you know, very, very uh, practical, very relevant um, uh, topics and big challenges. And I thought, boy, I'm going to lower the tone here uh, because you may not actually learn anything that's practically useful uh, today. Rather, I have a slightly different objective, uh, which is to, um, uh, to intrigue you or, or uh, uh, tweak your curiosity so that you want to learn more about this topic and explore uh, these, these ideas. Uh, exploring and working on these ideas that over time will develop some, some interesting new practical approaches. Uh, uh, to, uh, just to get started, um, the, you know, the, the, the question we want to ask is, well, what do, what do these guys need? <laughs> really goofy picture of our prime minister. I think his, his press crew are a lot more guarded than whoever <laughs> let the picture be, uh, be taken. Uh, but we know that, uh, that senior policymakers today, they, they don't need another Berlusconi bunga bunga party, but they, what they do need are uh, big challenges the world faces. And at the heart of many of the challenges that the world faces today is, are economic uh, uh, issues, whether it's the financial crisis, growth, poverty, uh, or climate change. And the key theme of this talk is going to be that we need an economics that describes the real world, that what's actually happening out there uh, uh, to, uh, to help give us solutions to these types of problems. And um, uh, the hope is that if we can describe the, uh, the real world better and in greater fidelity, uh, can we fix it and come up with solutions? Now, this cartoon was sent to me by a friend who was at the IMF meeting last week, and this will give you a, a sense of the mood. <laughs> Get a little bit better. Um, so uh, we're going to touch on a couple of topics. Uh, first, I'm, I'm just going to start with a few facts. They, they have nothing to do with anything you guys are probably dealing with in your daily life, but, uh, but they're interesting facts to an economist and facts that I believe need an explanation and are, in fact, hard for traditional economic theory uh, to uh, explain. And then I'm going to offer a, a different view on the economy than what's uh, uh, traditionally been uh, in, in economics textbooks and, and used in policy, what I call complexity economics. Uh, and uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about how that perspective uh, uh, works in terms of looking at how human social systems evolve, develop, and grow over time. And then we're going to try to land uh, with, uh, if not exactly uh, practical how-to insights, uh, with some thought starters on, on new ways these ideas might be applied in public policy, and then that will take us into the, into the breakout uh, discussions uh, where you guys will have the hard job of actually figuring out uh, how to make this stuff useful. Um, so first, just to start with a, 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 a few in, intriguing uh, facts to kind of whet the appetite. Um, fact number one is that uh, wealth uh, on a global basis has actually grown very explosively. It hasn't been a, a, a nice, linear, smooth development, but rather it's looked like this. Now, this is a, a time series you don't see very often. It's uh, world GDP per capita from 2.5 million BC to present. And we have to admit the statistics back in 2.5 million BC were not that great. <laughs> Uh, you know, don't ask will not certify uh, these, these, these numbers. Uh, but I'd say it's a semi-serious data set put together by Brad DeLong at, at Berkeley, where he uh, cobbled together uh, data from the archaeological record on how many calories people had and what kind of stone tools they had and so on, uh, with um, increasingly better data uh, as, as we go forward in time. And basically, the pattern of the world economy has been for a long, 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 long time, we were really, 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 really poor, and then all hell broke loose. Um, and if we zoom in to what uh, an archaeologist would say is the very recent past, about 15,000 uh, years ago, um, which is about when settled agriculture uh, started uh, uh, taking off, again, we see this, uh, this you know, same pattern of boom. Uh, and then if we zoom in, Again, uh, we see that uh, really that economic growth went through this just explosion uh, starting around 1950, 1800. Now, of course, we know what happened circa 1800, the Industrial uh, Revolution, and um, we have a great narrative as what 
happened and how many steam looms and you know, trains and other things were, were built during that time. But we don't actually have a th an economic theory that can account uh, for this pattern, where a system will kind of trundle along in a relatively low state and then just go through that kind of uh, explosion. Uh, explosive uh, growth. Um, economists traditionally a, a bit um, uh, kind of punting uh, on the answer. Uh, fact two, uh, that while um, wealth has grown explosively over a very long time, the complexity of our economy has also grown. And there's a, a measure that I use, I borrowed from retailers called stock keeping units, which is a shop might have, you know, ten different types of blue jeans in it, even though it may have multiple copies of each. Those are stock keeping units. And anthropologists, when they look at hunter-gatherer tribes, which is how the world lived up until uh, settled agriculture, they find that they have about you know, a few hundred different items, different types of you know, uh, uh, woven baskets and tools and, and, and things like that. Whereas uh, a modern economy, I estimate, has something on the order of 10 to the 10 uh, product variety. You know, just for an example, uh, the average Walmart store in the U.S. has 100,000 different types of products in it and lots of copies of each. Or my favorite, that there's 270 different types of breakfast cereal uh, 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 available. So we've had this huge explosion in the variety and complexity uh, in the economy as it's grown wealthier. Fact number three, that all of this happened with large. There was no sort of top-down plan. This emerged in a very uh, bottom-up uh, fashion. Uh, fact number four uh, is that all of this growth and order creation uh, came at which is a, a sharp uh, carbon emissions uh, or carbon concentration in the atmosphere, you know, from 10,000 years, about settling agriculture to now. And this is, this is my Al Gore moment, so watch this. Isn't that cool? That's, the, um, that's that GDP per capita chart that I showed you before, and you can see there's some connection here. Now, uh, that has absolutely no statistical meaning since I scaled things to make it look cool, but, but it sort of it gives the right, the right uh, uh, message that there's some relationship going on between that order creation uh, and growth and what's going on in the environment. And then lastly, fact number five, uh, we, we've gone through this um, uh, incredible uh, uh, event of a, of a you know, meltdown in the financial system kicking into the, into the uh, full economy and starting from a small corner of the U.S. Mer uh, uh, mortgage market and then expanding uh, uh, globally. So what kind of system, what kind of system could actually create this kind of behavior? Explosive growth, variety creation, collapses, uh, and, and so on. Well, uh, the traditional... Uh, uh, way we've explained the economy for about the last hundred years has been what economists call neoclassical economics. And this is the economics you find in, in, in most textbooks even today and provides the, the basis for a lot of public policy analysis. And it basically looks like this. Uh, the economy is assumed system uh, at, at rest, where essentially you have a set of forces, you have a set of constraints on the system, the utilities and preferences of consumers, or constraints on producers, their technologies. Then you have some for uh, self-interest uh, causing consumers and producers to try to optimize their behavior. And that combination of constraints, like the side of the bowl, and forces like the gravity here, uh, brings the system into an equilibrium uh, resting point uh, where supply meets demand and everybody's, uh, everybody's uh, 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 happy. And uh, the origins of this thing can go back uh, to the 1870s when a group of uh, economists at the time were trying to introduce mathematics into economics and borrowed a bunch of the physics textbooks. And at the time, the physicists were very interested in these equilibrium systems. And so that's kind of how modern economics uh, uh, got, uh, got going. But there's a basic problem that these kind of equilibrium systems don't do the five things that we just saw. They don't spontaneously, endogenously grow. They don't create, there's no mechanism for novelty, creation for newness. They don't self-organize, and they also don't just spontaneously collapse. And so to do those, those things that we just saw, economists have reached to what call exogenous factors, you know, things outside the economy that are feeding into it, shocking it uh, to make those uh, now, um, the economy as an equilibrium system or a system at rest is also 
been very much baked into the way uh, we do lots of public policy. Uh, and I've always liked this quote from the men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist, that the uh, defunct economists that we're uh, slaves to today are really the, you know, the uh, economists going from Walrus and Jevons back in the late 1800s to Marshall and Samuelson, Milton, in more, uh, more modern times, this uh, stream of what's called neoclassical uh, economics. And of equilibrium has become you know, deeply embedded in, in a lot of the policy tools we use. So if you, if you open up the cover in most you know, central banks or finance ministries, you find what are called DSGE models, dynamic stochastic equilibrium models, and those are basically a ball in the bowl uh, view uh, of the economy. Also, uh, uh, when we do cost benefit analysis and climate change are the types of models used in something like the Stern Review, that's another example, uh, the Washington Consensus and Development, and uh, you know, uh, the whole response to the financial crisis uh, has really been driven uh, from this, uh, a lot from this perspective and the debates we've been having about fiscal tightening versus stimulus and moral hazard and, and, and so on uh, really come from that uh, equilibrium. Equilibrium framework is also uh, to politics as well and the way we think and talk about left versus right uh, also uh, comes out of that intellectual uh, tradition. Um, now, policymakers started to really question whether this ball in the bowl equilibrium model was a good description of the reality uh, that they were uh, experiencing. And this is a quote from uh, Jean Claude Trichet, the president of the European Central Bank, uh, where he, he said, and I think you can read it, but the key point at the end, he says, we felt abandoned by the conventional tools. The models that they had in the European Central Bank, these equilibrium DSG models, could not reproduce what they were seeing in the crisis because every time they ran the models, they went back to a happy ending, a happy sort of smooth glide path into equilibrium where you know, deficits kind of unwound and employment came back and trade, you know, uh, China consumed more and you know, the U.S. saved more and everything was happy. And they, they you know, you, I have a vivid memory myself of working with one of these models in about 2006 and seeing all the imbalances in it. And every time I ran it, you know, we got a happy, a happy uh, answer, and, and that's a basic limitation to the assumptions and framework uh, in these models. And so this has set off quite a bit of debate in the, in the field of economics, is how do we uh, account for a phenomenon like the crisis? And the field is really divided up into three camps uh, these days. There's what uh, Thomas Kuhn in his book on scientific revolutions called the diehards, the people who will go to their grave, uh, you know, uh, defending the uh, uh, their the paradigm, and, and there's a, a group that believes that neoclassical economics you know, can explain the crisis. Uh, but I'd say the majority of the field is now in a middle camp of, of what could be called stretchers, who realize there's a need to change economic theory, to stretch and adapt it to accommodate what we've seen uh, in the crisis and, and uh, some of the other things I showed, but still want to keep the core framing of the economy as an equilibrium system. And then lastly are what you could call the Kuhnians, those who think that actually the equilibrium framing of the economy itself is a problem and we need uh, you know, a, a, a fresh start, a, a different way of looking at the economy. So I'm now going to talk about what that different way of looking at the economy might be. What if, if, uh, uh, if we believe the Camp 3 economists, well, how might we describe the economy? What's the alternative to this equilibrium view? And it's something that can be called a complexity economics uh, perspective. And uh, again, uh, there's increasing interest in, in policy circles in these ideas uh, uh, you know, uh, to, to try to uh, develop uh, tools and approaches from them. And this is, this is the follow-on from the same speech that Trisha gave. Um, uh, interest in approaches, bringing together ideas from physics, engineering, biology, is one point, a key point about uh, these uh, new ideas is that they are interdisciplinary. A lot of the thinking has come from the study of other complex systems in fields like biology, computer science, engineering, and, and so on. Now, uh, what do we mean by this phrase, complex uh, adaptive system? 
Well, uh, a complex adaptive system is a, is a generic way of describing a system that is complex. It's made up of lots of parts or particles or interacting agents. So think of you know the internet or uh, traffic jam uh, or a forest uh, ecosystem uh, or an economy. All of them are made up of lots of distributed parts. But those distributed parts or agents or particles um, uh, act their behavior in response to the environment. In a biological system will respond and, and adapt and evolve to its environment. Uh, a computer on the internet will change its behavior based on what's, you know, what inputs it's getting. Its outputs will be uh, different. Parts of the system aren't just static and staying still. Uh, they're adapting and changing. And that we can look at what scientists call emergent behavior. That as these individual parts and particles interact with each other, that you get larger uh, patterns uh, that, uh, that come up uh, from those interactions. So in, in economic terms, that could be economic growth or inflation, business cycles, unemployment, things like, uh, things like that would be, uh, emerge out of the micro interactions. Now here's just a little illustration of how you know, this might look in an economic context. So if we think of the economy as made up of lots of individual agents interacting with each other and they're heterogeneous, and occasionally those interactions come together and form coherent structures, organizations, uh, institutions, uh, and, and so on with a, a, a common purpose. So again, you have the distributed agents and then patterns of, of interaction. Some of those patterns are stable uh, over, over time. We call them firms, governments, things like that. Um, that those uh, uh, institutional structures also interact uh, with their environment and change and adapt as that happens, and uh, uh, there's the CEO just got fired. Uh, uh, and um, the, uh, uh, both the structure of the interactions changes as well as agents. And then lastly, uh, at a high level, you get other uh, structures, collections of institutions, you know, firms forming uh, industry uh, uh, structures, uh, and you have innovation going on in the system with, uh, you know, firms and industry sectors, you know, coming, coming in and out. And the relationship uh, between the, the agents and institutions in the uh, over time. So this is just to be a, a little visual representation that, that this is a much uh, equilibrium uh, ball in the bowl view. Uh, I'll do a little side by side. So, uh, first, uh, traditional economics has tended to view the economy in a fairly static way. Uh, the most sort of you know, famous example of this is the law of supply and demand, that you know, we have uh, supply on one side, um, uh, static uh, at a clearing price, unless. Uh, from outside. But in the real world, that it's actually a uh, uh, system. In your local supermarket, you see rows and rows of inventory because the supply coming in the back of the market never. Taylor, you've got a problem of trying to match these two, you know, uh, uh, jiggling uh, 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 lines of, of, of supply and, and demand, and it's moving uh, all the time. And uh, you know, we see this uh, these it's the uh, market makers hold stock, or even in service businesses, a lot of players sitting around to absorb. Supply and demand balances. Now, traditional noise in the system, and we can safely ignore it. Uh, but more recent work shows that actually these fluctuations in inventories uh, can play a critical role in cycles, and that actually when they get out of whack, uh, that that can be an important contributor to business cycles. And in the financial crisis, in fact, it was supply and demand not balancing, market seizing up, and not clearing that was a, a, a were a huge factor. Uh, uh, in creating the, uh, the financial uh, crisis. <laughs> um, 
uh, agents, we've also in, in economics traditionally taken a sort of fairly, you know, highly rational view uh, of human uh, behavior that we're perfectly rational optimizers and, you know, we're doing the uh, sort of, you know, uh, you know, uh, yen pound exchange rate when we um, you're probably all familiar, there's a huge amount of work from behavioristic view of, of how uh, agents in the economy behave, and that type of uh, view. Um, third, networks and institutions. In, in uh, traditional economic models, the network structure, the interconnectedness of, of uh, relations in the economy model. In fact, if you, know, if you look at economic papers or models, basically it runs like a giant eBay auction, you know, uh, uh, prices uh, clearing automatically. Matter. Uh, and this kind of thinking that institutional structures and networks don't matter actually created another big problem in the crisis. If you looked inside the models that both the ECB and the Bank of England had, they didn't have any models because the assumption is it's just clear. Well, uh, I think we, you know, we now can say that interconnections and institutional structures actually do matter. This is just a picture of the internet going on is to try to how uh, uh, economic models. One of my favorite phrases from the crisis was the phrase too connected to fail. You know, that the problem wasn't too big to fail. In fact, Lehman Brothers wasn't a particular Lehman Brothers created so many problems was it Greek economy is, is about the size of it's the effects Traditional economics, the things add uh, because it's assumed uh, whatever differences in individual consumer. Uh, it was actually the. of mortgages with big problems, even though the pockets of the system uh, were in, in, in big trouble. But I've always liked this quote from Schumpeter, uh, add successfully as many uh, mail coaches as you please, you railway, get a railway thereby. That focus on just quantity system of A, a very different way of looking at the economy, a real shift in thinking from this kind of static, rational, networks don't matter, you know, linear. Realistic view of behavior, taking into account networks, out of the micro. Over time. Let me... Um, Pardon? All right, I was just going to stop you there because I think you've got a problem with your mic. So Sorry. Just break an evolution in human social history. Yeah. Very quickly. Should I take this one off? Sorry, is that? 
think it's not so much a problem here, it's a problem that we're trying to record it. So, and that's where the volume level is messing around. Is that okay? Hopefully. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Sorry about that. So uh, I'm just going to spend a couple minutes talking about this idea that the economy is, is quite literally an, uh, an evolutionary uh, system. Um, now I should first note that um, uh, there's a, a long history of, of thinking of the economy as an evolutionary system. In fact, uh, economists invented evolution. It was our idea, <laughs> not the biologists. Uh, and uh, Darwin actually admits this in his own diaries. He notes that he got the idea for natural selection from Malthus uh, and, and, and his writings. But anyway, after Darwin stole our idea, then uh, economists uh, continued to develop uh, ideas on, on the economy as an evolutionary system, um, uh, going right up until recent times. But there's been a problem in that a lot of the work has been very kind of metaphorical, you know, thinking, well, maybe the economy is like uh, a, a biological system or, or uh, an evolutionary system, uh, and, and has never really gotten the same tra traction that the neoclassical program has got. And you know, we're accustomed to thinking of evolution as a biological uh, phenomenon. Um, but uh, a more modern view actually says that uh, what evolution is, is it has nothing to do with uh, biology per se. It's actually a, 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 a computational phenomenon. It's a way of computing. It's an algorithm. And it just happens that DNA is, is a, 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 a one substrate that evolution gets played out in, that DNA provides an information processing environment, uh, as, you, as it were, for, uh, uh, for evolution to happen in biology. But more generically, that evolution can be thought of as, a, as an algorithm or a formula for finding fit order in an environment. And the way it works is very simple, that uh, you have some process of variety creation, of experimentation that throws up a bunch of designs. You know, it could be designs for, uh, for a biological creature, or it could be designs for, say, that, uh, that chair. The key thing is you need uh, variety in the system. Then there's some process that selects what is a fit or unfit uh, version uh, of that design for whatever environment uh, it's, it's in. And then there's some process of amplification where fit designs get scaled up and unfit designs get, uh, get uh, scaled down and uh, then the process is repeated. And over time uh, what you see uh, are designs that evolve that are uh, increasingly uh, fit uh, for their environment and then as that environment changes the design of whatever it is uh, changes as well. Now, uh, describing it in words doesn't have the same impact as actually watching it. So uh, I'm going to uh, uh, see if this works. I'm going to show you a little video. So it's a little bit dated, but it still gets the, uh, gets the message across um, that actually shows some computer simulated evolution uh, in action. Um, and uh, this will run for just, uh, just a minute or two, but it gets the idea across.
<laughs> so, um, sorry. So, um, you know, I think th I think that that nicely illustrates how even though the algorithm of evolution, this process of just creating differentiation, selection, uh, and then uh, amplification, uh, has, is, is, despite its simplicity, is incredibly powerful. That it can create, you know, structure and design and coherence. Uh, and even can create novelty, you know, the things that surprise us, like that, you know, falling, uh, uh, falling design. Um, and also that uh, it's, a, it's a great algorithm for responding to changes in the environment. When, it, you know, uh, Sims took it, uh, the creatures from water and then put them on simulated land, uh, the, the process uh, started, uh, started up again. Um, now, uh, you might ask, okay, well, what does any of that have to do with the economy? Uh, you know, that um, uh, we may have this process of random mutation and experimentation in, in biology, or we can do it on computers, but uh, uh, in the economy, uh, we have humans uh, designing lots of things. Uh, Daniel Dennett, uh, uh, philosopher, likes to call evolution design without a designer. But in the economy, we have lots of designers, uh, uh, all, of, all of us. But uh, when you actually look at the history of technology development in the economy, what you see is, in fact, uh, an evolutionary process. Um, and if I just ask you a question, you know, who designed the modern bicycle? Well, I'd say, well, some bicycle designers. You know, somebody sat down and you know, made up blueprints and, and designed it. Well, when you look at uh, the history of the bicycle, what you actually see is something uh, a little bit more, uh, more interesting that uh, bicycles were you know, first developed uh, by you know, Victorian tinkerers uh, back in the uh, early 18 or mid 1800s, uh, experimenting with different ways of creating wheeled transportation using you know, materials available at the time, metal and wood and so on. And uh, the, the, now the problem is uh, designing uh, wheeled transportation is a very hard problem. You, you can't just design the optimal bicycle from first principles. If you sit down and say, what's the best possible bicycle? There is no answer to that question because you have too many variables, the materials you can use and you know, uh, how it could be written and, and so on. And so people uh, did, the, did the best they could and they designed all kinds of varieties of bicycles and you've probably seen them in museums, you know, some with big wheels and three wheels. And this one, which has two wheels but no pedals, you kind of shuffle a, a <laughs> along on it. And uh, so there was this process of, of deduction. Uh, they weren't building bicycles with square wheels. They were trying to use their deductive intentional power to you know, create something good. Uh, but there was a lot of tinkering going on, uh, of uh, experimentation. As, if any of you were trained as engineers, you know, you can you know, do stuff uh, in the lab or on paper all you want, but until you try it in the real world, you never know if it's going to work. Uh, and then some of these work better than others. These ones, you know, if you fell down off of, they hurt a lot. Uh, you know, these ones didn't go very fast and so on. 
And so, you know, over time, some of the designs were scaled up or amplified. More were made of them. And then a further process of reduction and tinkering and variation uh, went on up until we get the, uh, uh, the you know, the, the modern day bicycles and, and it, it continues on to this day. So this process of deductive tinkering is literally an evolutionary process. We use our creativity, our intentionality, our rationality to create variety in the system. You know, there's some criteria for what is a good and bad bicycle. And then, you know, we make more of the stuff that works and less of the stuff uh, that doesn't. And so all through technology history, you see these, these evolutionary uh, uh, patterns of, of uh, experiment, experimentation. And again, it's not random trial and error. It's intentional trial and error, but there's still trial uh, and error uh, going on. Um, and uh, I argue in the book that uh, this kind of deductive tinkering uh, uh, differentiation, selection, and amplification is going on in three key realms in, in the economy. One is um, uh, uh, what uh, Dick Nelson at Columbia calls physical technologies. These are what we conventionally think of as technology, so bicycles, microchips, aux-drawn plows, you know, what have you. And then uh, what he calls social technologies, which are designs for human institutions. So the invention of money, say, or the rule of law, uh, or venture capital, or just-in-time inventory management, or the idea of having a sales force. These were all inventions, um, uh, or you know, uh, what, uh, the, the, the invention of the joint stock company, uh, which played a huge role in the, in the Industrial Revolution, or organizing work in a factory. Uh, these are examples of social technologies. And just as one can't design the optimal uh, factory, uh, as, uh, you know, there's a process of deductive tinkering in these social technologies as well. Henry Ford, when he developed the first assembly line, he tried about 10 different ways uh, before he kind of got the idea of the cars should move and the people should stand still. So again, there was this process of deductive tinkering going on. Um, and uh, I, uh, sorry, I should have mentioned in the middle uh, that firms, businesses in the economy also have design to them. So you can think of a design for IBM or a design for Amazon or you know, a design for uh, 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 BP. Um, and uh, similarly, uh, the executives in those companies go through a process of, of uh, again, intentional, deductive, trying to improve their businesses, but in the process, creating variation, selecting plans that work, uh, and uh, putting people, capital, resources to amplify the stuff that's working and de-amplify the stuff that's not. Now, this process of business plan or firm evolution in the economy uh, really works at multiple levels that at an individual level, an executive in a business might be thinking, well, I could do option A or option B or option C to improve uh, my company. Uh, that's a process of, uh, of variation. Uh, I think option C is the best. That's selection, and it may be on criteria of what customers want, what shareholders want, what the regulators want, you know, whatever the fitness environment is. And then I'm going to put people and resources or scale, scale that up. Uh, and then that also happens at the level of organizations. People sit in an executive committee around a conference table and, and have a similar discussion. We should do option A, option B, option C, select one, go with it. And that also happens at the level of markets. Uh, the market is you know, selecting, is Amazon a better way of selling books than, uh, than, you know, than Waterstones? Those are two competing designs uh, for how one might sell, uh, sell books. And there's a process of, of selection and then amplification of talent, capital, and so on, moving to the uh, designs that are uh, selected. Um, now, if one uh, bought this idea that the economy is, is, is actually moving forward and working through this kind of deductive tinkering evolutionary process, uh, what are some predictions that you might make? Well, um, evolutionary systems actually do have that kind of explosive growth and explosive collapse uh, that, that we saw at, at the beginning. In biological systems, you know, the most famous is the Cambrian explosion, where you know, the, the life on Earth kind of trundled along at a low level, and then in a very short period of time, there was an explosion of innovation, variety creation, and, and growth of the biomass of, of, of the Earth. Uh, sort of the, you know, in, in one could view the Industrial Revolution as a kind of economic Cambrian explosion. Uh, evolution is, is, uh, is, in essence, an algorithm for creating complexity and novelty. It's spitting out novelty and, and new ways of doing things uh, all the time and, and bootstrapping from the simple up to the complex. Just as you saw in that video, we, they started with very simple blocks, and then there was a bootstrapping process up to more and more uh, complex uh, designs. And again, this happens in a very bottom-up, uh, spontaneous fashion. There's no sort of you know, necessarily top-down uh, direction. 
And the last prediction you'd make is that uh, the, the order creation doesn't come for free. This is basic physics, that as we create order, we use physical energy from the environment and, and put out waste and heat and, and greenhouse gases and, and other things. So there's a price to be paid. Now, uh, going from that very sort of high level abstract uh, view down to, okay, you know, what might this different view of the economy mean uh, in, in a policy setting? Um, and here I'm going to get on to even more speculative territory. If you thought that part was kind of speculative, wait till you see this part. Um, and I, I'm going to talk about just a few examples uh, that'll sort of warm us up for the, uh, for the uh, breakout session. Um, I'm, I'm first going to start at the level of technical tools. At a, at a very technical level, there's just new ways of doing modeling and analysis coming out of this that I think are pretty interesting, and I'll show a couple of examples. And, 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 and as you know, uh, people involved in policymaking know, you know, the models and analysis matters. That often you know, frames the discussion that ministers have and uh, policy decisions are made from. Second, uh, there are also just conceptual frameworks, new ways of thinking uh, uh, about problems, of understanding them, and, and, and so on. And then third, I'll ask, are there some higher level methodological things that we can take away from this, including the system stewardship uh, work that um, uh, the Institute for Government's been doing? And then lastly, uh, just a, you know, a little bit more philosophically, uh, I believe that this kind of thinking actually changes some of the political conversation as well about how we think about things like the role of, of the state. Um, so first, uh, just a, a couple more technical examples. And uh, here I'm going to um, see if uh, the Internet's working because I want to show you uh, a live example. So um, this is a technology uh, that, uh, that's called an agent-based model. So uh, this is a, a, a way that's been developed of modeling these kind of complex systems. And it's based on a simple philosophy. If you're trying to model a bunch of individual things interacting in complex ways that create some emergent behavior, well, the best way to do that is to model the individual things and see, see what happens. And uh, this kind of modeling has been used for all sorts of things from understanding uh, uh, epidemics and the spread of disease to uh, traffic management to the military has started to use uh, this technology a lot to model battlefield scenarios and, and things like this. And I'm going to uh, show you <coughs> one that was developed to uh, a, a health example to model the emergency room uh, of, a, of a hospital in uh, Tulsa, uh, Oklahoma. And uh, what you see here is the actual layout. This is the real physical layout of the hospital. Uh, and you can see the agents, the individuals, moving around. There's a, a little, and even some of the equipment, that's a gurney going. And you've got uh, uh, patients coming in, either by ambulance or walk-in, uh, and uh, then being seen to by, here's here, all the nurses are having their tea uh, in there. And the doctors are hanging out doing whatever doctors do in there. But as patients come in, there goes a nurse, goes out to, uh, see what's going on. There's a patient in the waiting room. She brings the patient back, takes to a treatment room. Uh, that patient then waits for hours <laughs> in position, uh, and, and so on. So you, you, can, you can kind of uh, get, the, uh, get the idea. Now, uh, the neat thing about these types of models is you can actually calibrate them with real data. So in this case, they actually you know, had good data on what kind of cases were walking through the door from ambulances and so on, and even at different times of the day. The reason why it's so slow now is this is 4, 4 a.m. I'll speed it up a, a little bit. Um, and you see it gets a lot busier as, as we go through the day. But you can calibrate it with real data. Uh, and then things like physical space matters, how long it takes people to walk places, uh, the physical uh, uh, layout of the, uh, uh, of the rooms, um, uh, you know, and staffing levels and, and so on. And you can, um, uh, you can also then you know, measure statistics, how much is equipment and people being utilized, uh, do you have log jams in, 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 in places, uh, and, and so on. And then you can run all sorts of what-if scenarios. So you know, let's say we wanted to uh, move the, you know, the express care unit you know, down here or change the staffing level of nurses or you know, uh, change the staffing levels at the registrar. You know, you can play with this in, in <laughs> sorts of ways. But the key thing is it gives you a granularity and realism that you just can't get from a more aggregated model. You know, if you used a sort of a high-level model that just looked at utilization rates or something like that, you, uh, you, you wouldn't uh, be able to, uh, to do that. So this is one just sort of more kind of technical example of a, uh, a complexity approach. Um, and uh, I'm going to 
now talk about uh, another uh, use of modeling, which is uh, in uh, these big macro models that central banks and, and finance ministries use. And uh, just to demonstrate how those work today, I got another short uh, video. Um, this is how the models inside the central banks use work today. Basically, you assume that there's an exogenous shock coming from outside the system, like this finger poking the jelly. <laughs> and then the economy, represented by the jello, uh, wiggles and moves and responds to that I exogenous shock and goes through you know, a set of oscillations or, or you know, volatility. But then it eventually settles, settles back down I into, uh, into an uh, equilibrium, uh, equilibrium state. Um, but as I described before, um, that uh, assumes that all the interesting stuff is happening in the finger, uh, the, the exogenous shock, uh, rather than coming endogenously from uh, the dynamics of the system. Now, you know, the subprime crisis wasn't just a giant finger from the sky kind of poking the system. You know, the system had a set of flaws and vulnerabilities uh, in it um, uh, to, uh, to, to, to begin with. So we would like a more endogenous way uh, of, of, uh, of, of looking at this. So I'm currently involved I I in a major effort that's just getting started uh, to build an agent-based model of the financial system. So think of that ER or A&E model, but for the financial system with uh, banks, uh, uh, with households, you know, borrowing money, getting mortgages and things like that, with individual firms producing their stuff, also getting uh, you know, commercial loans and, and, and so on, and then sitting in the middle uh, in, in the, uh, 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 the, the gray lady in, uh, at bank um, having to respond uh, with, uh, with uh, policy uh, in this system. And um, this is still in early stages, but uh, uh, we think it's quite promising and, and we're actually having uh, good collaboration from the Bank of England and from the ECB and the New York Fed as, as well uh, on uh, trying to build uh, this, this uh, model. And just as with that A&E model, you want to be able to experiment well, if we reconfigure the system this way or that way, what would be the scenarios and, and implications? Or in the case of something like the Greek crisis, you could model you know, different scenarios for contagion and, and, uh, and so on. Um, now, a couple of more uh, just quick conceptual uh, examples. Um, there's been some interesting work looking at uh, growth policy um, and actually looking at economic growth as an evolutionary system, as we discussed before. This is some uh, work by um, uh, Hausman and Hidalgo at Harvard, um, where they've actually uh, mapped the network of products and capabilities in a whole set of uh, economies and built these, uh, these lovely network maps that show the interconnections and relations between different sectors in the economy. This is a typical industrial economy, and so you see you know, the uh, agricultural sector is over here, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, autom automotive and electronics and, and, and so on. And each of these bubbles uh, represents a, a, a set of, um, uh, uh, of products and capabilities that uh, are required and assets required to support those, those products. And as they, they have uh, analyzed these network structures and watched how they evolve over time, because they've done it at different slices in time, what they see is that um, uh, there's this branching, product, uh, branching process in the product space. So, you know, automotive technologies yield, you know, over time aerospace technologies, uh, for example, uh, or, uh, you know, semiconductor industries then evolve into consumer electronics uh, businesses, as in the case of Taiwan or, or Korea, uh, for example. And that as this, you know, in the, what firms are trying to do is find new profitable spaces in this, in this kind of, you know, product space. But um, as uh, Hausman likes to say, the monkeys can't jump far from the, from the trees. That if you're looking for you know, trees with more fruit in the forest, you know, you're kind of hopping from tree to tree. You can't just miraculously you know, go from uh, electronics over to you know, uh, whatever's over here, garments or, or, vice, or vice versa. Uh, that there's a sort of a traversing path that one uh, has to uh, take and that these traversing paths then in turn depend on clusters of capabilities and, and skills. And so this then leads to some interesting policy questions. Is, you know, if you understood these structures and, 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 and the skills and potential paths, uh, you know, could you design uh, more targeted and effective uh, uh, growth policies? And this approach is also being looked at in the context of, of economic development because one thing we see is that these 
you know, the structures of the product and capability space look very different in industrialized countries versus, say, uh, sub-Saharan uh, Africa. And in essence, you know, what many development failures are involving is where we're trying to sort of plunk down a set of capabilities in a, in a part of the space that isn't, you know, uh, isn't kind of currently occupied or, or underpopulated. And as Hausman said, it's, it's in essence like, you know, trying to turn a, you know, a fish into a tree frog. You know, we haven't sort of gone through the, the evolutionary, uh, evolutionary path. Um, because uh, we're running a bit late on time, I'm going to save this for uh, when the development, if there's a small development group uh, that breaks out, we can talk about some, some other hypotheses for, uh, for development. Uh, another example where you have, might have a conceptual shift is climate change. Um, and in a complex systems view, climate change isn't viewed just as an externality uh, in the system, but actually the climate is a part of the complex system that the economy exists in. Uh, that, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is basic physics, in fact, that, uh, you know, coming into the agents interacting, buying and selling and making things in the economy are real energy inputs from fossil fuels and from calories from, from agriculture, and that that's creating the ordered outputs uh, in the system, the goods and services, uh, and also the disordered uh, outputs of waste products, heat and gas. So in these types of models, uh, looking at climate effects isn't just sort of an afterthought or an add-in, it's actually something that's quite embedded in, in uh, the whole way that uh, one thinks about uh, these, these systems. Um, and just to be a little bit more specific, um, uh, you know, if we, if we look at the traditional economic assumptions around climate change uh, and, and much environmental planning, uh, you know, we uh, see that, you know, there's often, again, assumptions that people are behaving perfectly rationally, that uh, risk is distributed in nice bell curves. Uh, in most of these models, it doesn't get called out much, but the time is reversible. You can run things forward and backwards uh, equally well. Um, uh, that they're linear, you know, that, um, uh, that uh, the production function in these models is in essence uh, infinite, that there's no physical limitations of res resources uh, like energy or, or materials. Uh, and, it, and, and we've already talked about a very you know, limited view of, of innovation. Um, uh, a complexity view allows you to incorporate, again, uh, uh, more realistic behavior, how do real consumers behave and real companies behave, uh, to uh, deal with the irreversibility. So, for example, in the real climate system, if the methane comes out of Siberia, you can't stuff it back in. You know, that's an irreversible uh, process, and that need, things like that need to be taken into account. Uh, you've probably all heard about, you know, the notion that there's tipping points in the climate system. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so on. So, you know, this uh, offers uh, a way of thinking about climate problems that is more tuned to the reality of the interlinked economic and climate systems. Um, in terms of overall methodologies, uh, I, I would just like to call out the work that uh, the Institute for Government has done on this notion of, of system stewardship that, um, and I think copies of the paper are, uh, are, are outside, but the, you know, the basic, uh, notion that the authors put forward is that um, the role of, of policy making isn't to be the optimal designer. You know, just as we can't design the optimal bicycle from first principles, designing often the optimal policies from first principles is an even harder, uh, more impossible problem. That rather uh, the role of the policy maker is uh, to set overall goals and rules and guidelines, what in an evolutionary context might be called the fitness, part of the fitness function. So, you know, part of the, what we think of as the, the fitness environment for the economy in our society would be that companies don't steal, they don't kill their consumers, they treat labor responsibly, you know, other, other things could be part of that fitness uh, response. And then th the system adapts and evolves in response to those fitness constraints, and then there's uh, feedback from the system which then allows adjustments and adaptations uh, in, in, the, in the policy. So uh, rather than command control, this sort of system stewardship uh, and the authors note that, you know, that there's a spectrum of this, that there may be some situations where command and control is, is necessary, where, you know, something has to be done in exactly in a certain way the first time. So, say, there's a, you know, safety issue or, or something like that, uh, where it's a relatively simple problem and where also capacity in the system for the actors to adapt may be limited. You may still go in a very direct kind of more command and control way. But when, uh, when there is scope for adaptation, when the, you know, the optimal answer can't be known in advance, uh, uh, when you know, some uh, experimentation could be tolerated, then uh, this uh, type of approach 
uh, may, be, uh, uh, may be better. And you know, this raises an interesting question. Evolutionary systems are, uh, are systems of experimentation. You know, the key thing that makes them work uh, is this process of variety uh, uh, creation and then getting feedback from the environment and adjusting and so on. So uh, an interesting question is, can we actually do real experimentation in policy making? Now, it's much harder uh, you know, than, say, in a laboratory, but it, it can be done. And, and you know, there are examples of experiments in things like education policy, health policy. I, I was uh, with some folks doing development uh, work a couple of weeks ago, and I was very impressed. It, you know, real rigorous, you know, control field trials, you know, on, on development policies in, in Africa, for, uh, for example. Um, uh, now, you know, from a technical policy standpoint, experimentation often is both desirable and possible. The harder problem is the politics of it, because, you know, for a politician to say, well, we don't exactly know the optimal way to solve this problem, so we're going to try five things. You know, we'll do this in the Northeast and that in the Southeast and this in Wales and that in Scotland and let the thing run. And then, you know, the people in the Northeast, it, it, it doesn't work out so well. You know, then everyone wants to know whose fault it is. Uh, and so somehow we need to square the circle between the value of doing experimentation and policy with the uh, political difficulties uh, that, it, uh, that it creates. Uh, and then lastly, and I'll, I'll wrap up, just, you know, uh, that I believe that this view of the economy as a complex system also can influence our politics. Um, you know, if we think about what we've seen over the past few decades, that, you know, we've seen the end of one era, that the, uh, the, the notion that uh, state planning uh, can, you know, lead to, uh, uh, lead to good outcomes in, in the economy, basically collapsed with the collapse of the, the Berlin, uh, Berlin Wall. And then at the other extreme, you know, we've seen that, uh, you know, a, a real hands-off laissez-faire approach to markets has also not worked out uh, so well in the, in the recent uh, uh, financial crash. And, uh, you know, that our old political frameworks of left versus right have been sort of disoriented and kind of scrambled uh, a bit uh, uh, by this. And, you know, so there's a lot of questions. Well, is, is the answer just a sort of a, a kind of a, a compromise in the middle somewhere, a bit of state, a bit of market, and we all kind of, you know, get along and make it work? Or is there a different way of, of, of framing it? And, you know, I would just put up that, that complexity economics offers the potential to think about this in a different way, that, you know, if we take the traditional position of the left that markets may be necessary but don't produce just outcomes, uh, but states, are an essential mechanism for ensuring social, social justice and protecting people from, uh, from market failures, to the rights view that uh, markets are the most efficient mechanism for allocating resources. And so almost by definition, anything that states do distorts or takes away uh, from that efficiency. And so you have the imperative that state interference should be minimized. Um, a, a complexity view would say that actually neither of these is, is quite right that uh, markets as evolutionary systems are not perfectly efficient in allocation. Evolutionary systems are hugely inefficient, in fact, and create a lot of, uh, of waste. But what, uh, what markets as evolutionary systems are good at is that innovation process and that evolutionary process of, of wealth creation. They're highly effective. But for that evolutionary process to work, the state has to create the institutional conditions for, uh, for, uh, for that uh, evolution and also shapes the fitness function, as I described before, that that's, uh, that that's occurring in. So uh, it starts to ask then different, uh, force you to ask different questions about the role of the state, such as, well, how can we make economic evolution work better? How can we orient the fitness function toward uh, the needs of society and, and so on? So just to wrap up, um, uh, that uh, the argument is that human social systems, including the economy, are complex adaptive systems and they grow through evolutionary processes that this view of the economy can explain some things that have been previously hard to explain by traditional economic theory, and that this may lead to uh, better policy. And uh, just to uh, Albert Einstein, I always like this Einstein quote that we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. And I'll give Bob the Builder the last word. <laughs> Famous advertiser. Thank you. So that was an amazing tour de force by Eric Erwin. We're slightly off timing, she said, uh, thinking how to adapt now. So why don't we just start off with anyone here who's got some sort of general questions, comments, uh, 
etc cetera, etc cetera, and see whether that before we then see whether we've got time to run some discussions in uh, in breakout sessions any questions or is it also blindingly obvious been thinking this all along yes can you say who you are we've got a microphone rov ro roving around so yeah Jeremy Mayhew uh, um, I thought it was very interesting the only thing that I question is how revolutionary it is I mean on on the one hand who has ever believed the sort of perfect market assumptions in the economic textbooks in the, the basic argument as I've always been understood it is um, their approximations which are valid or not according to their predictive power that's a summary but more particularly it struck me that a lot of what you said would have been and I know you mentioned him in passing would have been very familiar in Hayek's work with his arguments about markets as discovery mechanisms the emphasis on trial and error the deep skepticism about planning and top-down um, and I just wonder what your attitude to his thinking is even if you wouldn't necessarily agree with what you said about the role of the state at the end okay let's t let's take a couple, couple. we've got uh, yep there and then we've got some complexity experts coming back at you <laughs> so thank you um, I, I half agree in the sense that uh, one of the first things I did when I was a policy advisor was look at an impact assessment which was perfectly based on the economic rational model uh, and I was asked to give a view on it and I said well it's all made up it was you know I still had to get a minister to sign it off. Um, a lot of what you said, it strikes me, is based in the tradition of systems practice and systems thinking. Uh, and I, in a sense, it would be great if uh, economics, as the digital science, caught up with most other sciences and started to be systemic in how it thought about things. So if, if that's part of this journey, that's got to be fantastic. Very particular question, though. Piloting. I, I, isn't there an implication in some of what you've said that the state at the center can't pilot. It can only create conditions that allow other people to pilot and then to learn from those things and perhaps tweak the conditions that it's got. Uh, because, as I said, well, for lots of reasons, but that evolutionary dynamic isn't at the center, it's out in the field. Okay, let's just take a third one here. Thank you, Olaid Gal. Um, it seems that complexity economics really came a long way in terms of taking from uh, natural sciences and really showing and moving from static to dynamic look at economics. But I think that in terms of really being effective and the real revolutionary shift will really only come when you also reframe what the economy actually is and what are the actually boundaries of that jello. Because you can't really think about systemic collapse uh, without thinking about the politics of home ownership or uh, about uh, policy preference for consumption rise versus uh, pay rise, uh, preemptive discourse on national security and environment, et cetera, et cetera. And I just noticed that there is no politics and politicians in the new models. You have markets, organization, and individuals, and even in this project crisis, there are no politics. Mm -hmm. Quite an interesting to your model, actually, I thought. Yeah. No voters, no politicians. Why don't we take those ones? So okay. no role for the state, no politicians, and it's actually what we were taught at Oxford 500 years ago or whatever, yeah. stuff like that. Exactly. So. Uh, well, first, uh, on, the, on the question of, well, you know, did economists never believe this perfect rationality uh, stuff? Uh, you know, you're right. They, they've always said, well, it's, it's just an approximation. But... Um, uh, you know, there's, uh, and, and all science is, is an approximation. Uh, you know, even particle physics is an approximation of some reality. But uh, uh, one scientist described a good analogy. It's, it's like having a, a, a map uh, of the world. You know, your road map is an approximation of the real road system you're seeing. Uh, you know, it doesn't have all the detail, there's assumptions and so on. But it has to be a fidelity with that real world. You know, if, if your map says the road's going this way and the real road's going this way, then it's not a very useful map. And that's been the problem with traditional economics. It's, it's a bad approximation. Uh, and there's, you know, a huge body of empirical evidence showing that we don't behave rationally or that, you know, these network structures do matter and, 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 and so on. So the argument is, is that, you know, this is uh, just a better, a better map. And you're right, it's not all completely new by any stretch. There's a long, in, I, I didn't have time to go into it, but there's a very long intellectual tradition uh, kind of under, underneath this, including, and I would put Hayek very much in that tradition, uh, uh, Schumpeter, 
um, and uh, Veblen and, and um, Marshall uh, and, and quite a number of others. Uh, but the, the things really kind of took off starting in the 80s because we got computers. Um, complex systems are hard to understand with just pencil and paper, and it helps a lot to have uh, computers. And things biologists and physicists and others were doing uh, uh, provided new, new tools. On the question of, uh, well, first I agree with your comment on systems uh, thinking. Um, and can the state pilot? Well, uh, you know, the, 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 this, as in a democracy, we charge the state with taking care of certain problems. And we expect the state to take care of certain problems. And so the state has to go through its own kind of deductive tinkering process and trying to come up with solutions and improve them and so on. So I would say absolutely the state not only can but should be uh, piloting and trying an experimental approach um, as, as much as it can, you know, again, subject to the constraint of, of politics, which takes me to uh, the last question. And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, the, 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 the economy is a complex system sitting in a whole nest of other complex systems, some of them human social systems like our political systems or, you know, uh, national security uh, issues. Um, uh, you know, we've got, you know, within that things like culture and values and all sorts of things going on. And then that whole human social system is then embedded in the larger physical system of, of the environment. So another question in science is in any model, where do you draw the boundaries? Because, you know, you can't, you know, model the whole thing or, or if you try to, you, uh, you know, the, your model becomes as complicated as what you're trying to model and you don't understand it any better. So we always have to draw boundaries. So the, the, the question is for the problem that you're looking at, what are the relative systems that you need to capture? So, uh, you know, for some, uh, you know, pol politics and political economy absolutely could be, you know, very core or environment or, 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 or other issues. But th those are decisions that you have to make. Okay, let's do another quick round of, oh gosh. <laughs> Let's see, we'll go to the back, <laughs> come here. And then I'm going to allow Mike to have a have a word. Yeah, yeah. say who you are. Hi, I'm Anne Griffiths. I'm working at Ewing Council. Um, just a very simple question, really. How how do you envisage this being? Uh, what the outcomes would be when it's practically applied to public policy, um, and what you think the best possible outcomes of that might be? Yeah. Uh, this is Tim Harford from the Financial Times, um, and I would recommend Eric's book, The Origin of Wealth, <laughs> to everybody. It's wonderful. Uh, that said, Eric, I'm, I'm going to call you on something. So you, you showed us a picture of Spock, and you said behavioral economics, very important, and the complexity view incorporates that. You quoted Trichet as saying he would love solutions from engineering. Um, now, I, I, that seems perfectly sensible. Wouldn't it be great to have psychologically more complex models? Wouldn't it be great to, when we think about how financial systems melt down, wouldn't it be think great to think about sort of the engineering perspective of know, uh, safety systems, how they all work. Um, but these, these are not really evolutionary biology models. And you showed us Cesar Hidalgo's work. That's network physics. He, he maps networks. It's not an evolutionary model. And the main thrust of what you were telling us was uh, agent-based modeling is, is a wonderful way to look at this. But agent-based models have very simple assumptions about individual behavior and individual motivations. So that's actually moving further away from realism, whereas behavioral economics is moving towards realism. Now, all of these approaches seem to me very fertile. The question is, uh, are we really looking at a, a new paradigm, or are we looking at a patchwork of very different approaches that don't necessarily sit well together? Okay, and finally. Uh, yeah, Mi Michael Holsworth. Um, thank you for a fantastic presentation, Eric. Um, just wanted to ask you about the, if you like, the evolutionary fitness of some of these ideas uh, for the government sphere, because about nine, ten years ago, um, there was a really good pamphlet by um, a guy called Jake Chapman for Demos System Failure, I think it was called, which basically set out a lot of, a lot of this thinking and applied it to government. Um, however, um, it happened to coincide with a very, uh, if you like, directive period of top-down sort of. Um, uh, target-based culture uh, in, in the way that the state was conceived of. Um, and Jake went around Whitehall for a number of years. Um, uh, you know, it had a lot, fair amount of impact, but it kind of died away again. Do you feel that there is the opportunity this time for it to take hold in a much more uh, fundamental way with perhaps the opportunity for after the collapse of uh, financial markets and so on, and the current government's commitment to decentralization 
could it break through and have more success this time, or will it will there be a retrenchment once more? I think that goes a bit actually to Anne's question as well of actually so what's the what's the case for this in terms of offering sort of practical better outcomes? So I'll, I'll take and I'll take those two together, but. Um, let me, uh, I'll first come to uh, uh, Tim's uh, excellent question, mm. and I'll also hawk his book. I was going to say, his uh, Adapt, <laughs> which is good. absolutely, uh, absolutely brilliant, and would, would have been a much more fun read on the beach this summer than my... I've book. read that as well, but that's a train ride book. Your book takes a whole holiday with Tim's. Tim's is a train ride. Um, anyway, so very good train ride, but... So, well, first, you know, um, I mean, there were, there were a couple points in your question. You know, the point about uh, behavioral realism in the models is a very is a very difficult one because uh, on you know on the one hand you know human behavior is so complex and rich we will never capture it in any you know model uh, fully there will always be aspects of it that we are left out or just not even understood the key point is um, that uh, though that e even though we're you know mysterious creatures with free will etc cetera, etc cetera, there's a lot of regularities in human behavior uh, you know, I'll, I will bet that if we had a break and all went and got tea and came back, you'd come and sit in your same seat. I can make that prediction, you know, and you'd probably be mostly successful. You know, people behave in regular ways. So the key thing is to understand what regularities of behavior are important for the problem that you're looking at and trying to capture those. And, uh, you know, there's no, there's no kind of one answer to that. In the, in the agent-based modeling literature, there are models that actually have zero intelligence agents that assume, you know, the opposite of traditional economics, assume everybody is perfectly stupid uh, and then see what happens. And that often sort of highlights what the structural, uh, you know, impacts are that you take behavior out and then, then put in sort of more rich and realistic behavior and, and see how that, uh, how that uh, changes it. So, uh, you know, the way I, I think of behavioral economics is, you know, this is a, uh, a great rich set of empirical results that can be drawn on uh, in, in uh, doing this kind of, of economics. On, um, you know, your point about Hidalgo's work is, uh, you're right, that's a network analysis. I, I described it as evolutionary because they've looked at this over time and it, and it leads to some thinking about, well, if these network structures are important in understanding economic growth, well, how those networks change over time could be a subject of interest to growth policy. And that's actually some, some new work that's uh, underway to, to, to look at that. Um, uh, and, but the, your last point about is this a paradigm or a patchwork, I think is, 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 a, is a, fair, uh, a fair question. Um, uh, there is no overarching theory of complex systems. Uh, in fact, that might even be a contradiction <laughs> term. Um, but uh, we, through a whole set of tools and approaches, we can gain insight into complex systems. And it's what philosophers of science call a research program uh, would probably be a better description than, than a, uh, a paradigm. But, uh, you know, I'm optimistic that by ap applying these multifaceted approaches, we can learn a lot more about how these systems work. Now, on the question of, uh, you know, What's the, what would you get benefit? I'd say there's still too few actually hard case examples of here's how we did it the old way, here's how we do it the new way, the new way was different and better. Where there are examples are in, uh, outside of economics and things like health policy, so uh, endemic uh, uh, prevention, a lot of the work that was done on bird flu and other things used these types of complex systems approaches and did come up with very different policy interventions and different analyses of the, of the system. Um, uh, you know, the military also has examples uh, as, as, as well. Uh, economics, we're really only just getting, getting started. Um, and, you know, the question of, well, why, is, why hasn't this taken root? These ideas have been kicking around for some time. Well, you know, some of it is, is just given. People have been trained in a certain way. They went to university, studied economics this way. Uh, that's how you do things, it has credibility, you know, and, and, and so on. It's hard to get people to change their thinking. And, uh, you know, uh, the neoclassical economics paradigm took several decades to get rooted. You know, if you look at when Samuelson and Arrow's work was done in the 40s and 50s and so on, it really only started getting rooted in public policy in kind of the 70s, 80s, 90s. So, you know, by that standard, we still got about 20 years you know, to, to work on this. Uh, I'm hoping it'll happen faster, and the crisis has been a, a big accelerator in, in making people more open 
am interested in this kind of uh, thinking. Now, you know, someone like, you know, a central bank is not going to just chuck their current model out the window and go with something like this, and they shouldn't. But rather, you know, a careful process of continuing to use the old models, build new ones, experiment, compare, contrast, you know, that seems very valuable. I think we've got five and a half weeks to save the euro, haven't we? So we need to put you on a sort of very fast track. <laughs> Let's just take a couple more questions, then we'll see and try and combine the drinks social session with some, uh, some structured networking. Okay, I've got three, so I'm going to go there, there, and then here. Hello. Just who you are as well. Uh, Luke, Luke Robinson. I'm a, um, I'm a physicist, and I've worked in ecology and things like this. Um, I if you have multiple systems competing against e each other, don't you, ha you have a lot of redundancy, so there's a cost. So you have to, like, probably from a policy perspective, sell that this cost is going to create its advantages. Um, and I think that's probably going to be a very hard thing to sell to the public, sort of thing, just for comment. Okay. Yeah, and then in front of you, yes, here, here. Uh, Tom Aldridge, Cabinet Office. Um, one recent uh, public policy issue that I don't think traditional economics has explained very well uh, is the London riots. I just wondered whether... Um, your model uh, explains that any better. Okay, and Hi, Sam Sims, uh, Institute for Government. Um, often in the policy literature when people are complying, uh, applying sorry, complexity theory, the standard thing to say is that uh, this means we should be doing more kind of slow adaptation, more um, piloting and things like that. Now I can totally see how more slow adaptation and feeling your way and as you've helpfully described, something like uh, deductive tinkering is useful. But it seems to me that complexity, seeing the world as complex, might make piloting even less useful than it is in a normal world. Since if the world's characterized by all these kind of riotous non-linearities, then any small differences in a, a policy program in the pilot stage might make the results as it's rolled out totally different. Okay. Very good set of questions there. Excellent. Um, so uh, first on, on, on the question of uh, efficiency versus redundancy, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, e evolutionary systems are hugely inefficient and have lots of uh, redundancy and, and, and waste in them. And there's a well-known uh, um, trade-off in, in complex evolutionary systems between system robustness and, you know, that degree of, of uh, you know, uh, redundancy uh, in, in the system. And um, uh, in, in you know what what often uh, can happen in, in complex systems is that uh, if a system is stable for a period of time, it will actually drive to some notion of, of efficiency. You know the inefficient gets weeded out, and but then that makes it more brittle uh, when when things change. And so the worst kind of um, environment for uh, evolutionary systems is something that's sort of stable, 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 and then bang, something happens, you have to adjust, and, and, and then stable, stable, stable. Uh, it's actually easier to either be, you know, stable or, or, or volatile. And, um, you know, the economy does tend to be a bit like that, you know, where we go through a period like the 90s where things are relatively stable, and then we have these, uh, uh, these periods of, of, of turbulence. So, you know, the short, the, the answer is that, uh, to make the system more robust, there is going to have to be inefficiency in it. Um, and, you know, we certainly count. Engineers think this way. You know, when, when you build a bridge, you don't build the most efficient bridge. Um, you, you know, you put in, uh, you know, error margin uh, uh, in it. And, you know, we need that, a bit more of that kind of thinking. London riots, I, I think, would be a great example uh, of the opportunity to apply uh, some of this thinking. I, I have seen some modeling work in political science on, um, uh, political change. Um, you know, there's some modeling of the Berlin Wall dynamics and, you know, sort of the uh, social network effects and so on. And I think there's some folks doing work on the Arab Spring type stuff. And that, kind of that could also be applied in a less positive sense uh, to, to the riots. Um, on the question, great question about, you know, pilots, uh, you know, if you're taking lots of time to put pilots into an environment that itself is changing, you know, faster than you're learning from the pilots, you've, you've got a problem. Um, so, you know, then if, if you need to kind of then start rethinking about what do we mean by pilot? Is 
what we usually think of as pilot is a top-down program designed by somebody sitting somewhere, you know, that we're doing at a small scale, and then we measure it and then make it bigger. So uh, piloting is still kind of a, is still a way of doing top-down policy. So in a fast-moving environment, I, I would think about other sort of more distributed bottom-up solutions that may not be piloting. You may be actually doing whatever it is, but creating mechanisms to allow you know, learning from one part of the system to transmit more sort of horizontally rather than up and down to another part of the system. And you shaking your head, she's probably actually done mm. this. <laughs> I think Greg is very keen to, Greg who helped to set up these seminars. Thank you, um, Greg Fisher. Um, I'm, I'm heading up a think tank. I'm gonna plug myself if you don't mind, Jill. <laughs> I'm head heading up a think tank with Paul Ormond to take this thinking actually into the policy terrain. Um, so uh, come and talk to me later if you want. Sorry, Jill. Um, uh, the question I've got, That's Eric, the book is actually as well, Greg. <laughs> 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 exactly. Well, Paul has actually just written a new book. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, I'm going to turn this into a question um, uh, about the big society. Really, it links in what you, what you just said um, about sort of expression, decision-making power, and so on and so forth at different levels of society. Do you think complexity has anything to kind of add to the big society debate at all, uh, particularly related to? Um, power and responsibility amongst the population in different layers, le levels. Okay, so any last burning question? Yes, one there. Uh, Carl Allen, I'm retired, so things are fairly simple for me. <laughs> <laughs> I had wondered, will we move from complexity economics to something simpler, something perhaps elegant, or are we, are we going to be stuck? Or will we have to move to become complex? Great. Um, well, first on, on, on Greg's uh, question, like a, like a good civil servant, I'm going to say resolutely politically neutral. Uh, um, uh, but um, I, you know, I think the the, the basic uh, ideas behind you know uh, uh, big society and, and uh, tapping into a more bottom up approach and values and, 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 and uh, norms and bringing different actors uh, into uh, solving social problems. Uh, could fit into uh, a complexity uh, framework, and I know there's been some interest in in in, uh, in, in looking at that. So, I, you know, I, I would sort of tee that up as a to be uh, explored uh, topic. And same same also with the arguments over devolution uh, would be another. You know, be interesting to look at uh, as part of that through a complexity lens. Um, uh, you've given us a great philosophical question to end with: uh, <laughs> complexity versus simplicity. You know, an interesting thing about complex systems can sometimes be very simple. Um, you know, when you analyze them, what you, you may find is that what looks like quite complex, messy behavior is actually coming from just one simple little thing, uh, you know, down in, down in, the, uh, in the system. Um, uh, an example somebody once uh, gave me was, in, if you ask why does the, U, why does the U.S. had such bad urban sprawl, uh, you know, in strip malls and things like that. that you, know, you think that's a very complex phenomenon out of all sorts of, of factors. But this person made actually a pretty persuasive argument that a simple change in planning rules uh, on square footage of parking per square footage of retail space actually lay at the heart of a whole chain of economic and social decision making which then kind of rippled out and you know, uh, created uh, these, these, these changes. So sometimes you know, a change in one sensitive part of the system, one little rule here or there, can have actually quite big uh, disproportionate uh, effects. Or another example would be a regulatory change of what's called the, it may be called something different in Britain, but in the US it was called the prudent man policy. Sorry, this was the 70s, so it was a bit more sexist. Uh, uh, created the whole private equity and venture capital industry. It was just a change in how you know, uh, investors were supposed to behave. So uh, sometimes at the heart of messy complexity uh, is, sim uh, is uh, simplicity. But your, you know, your question of, well, do we have to become more complex in our thinking? I think that's also true, too. And this goes back to the earlier comment about systems thinking. I think that we have to also train our brains to actually look at things in a more system way, to understand dynamics. Um, and so when we, we are simplifying, we're using the, might, the right kind of mental uh, tools to do so. OK, I think that's a brilliant point to end this bit. So what we're going to do, she said, is um, 
apart from plugging future policymaking events at IFG, so keep looking at our websites and flyers on about that, is what we thought we'd do is give you a chance to think through applying these concepts in some areas. Um, so we've actually tagged, I think, six people, seven people, who are up for standing by a bit of magic paper or whiteboard to help you talk about these things. Um, so I'm going to name who they are and where they're going to be. What I suggest we do is usually in the IFG you get a free drink, but what I suggest is now you grab a drink and then you gravitate towards one of these. If, as I said earlier, you want to talk about something different, uh, you can nominate that you want to talk about that differently from other people, or you can just hang around and have a drink with people. Um, but I think it's really interesting. I'm going to ask Eric to rove and join your discussions. Uh, he's not going to mark you out of 10 or anything as to whether you get it or not. We've also got some other sort of experts in complexity. We've got Greg, we've got Eve Nicholson Kelly from LSE. We've got other people who are up with that. Tim, I think, is sort of a complexity expert. He's very happy to do that. Anyway, so we'll get some people to rove around and join your discussion. Um, so the topics we selected, which may of course be wrong, but they bear an uncanny relationship to those listed by uh, Eric, are growth with Philip Rutnam. Philip is a DG at Business Innovation and Skills, and we've put Philip in the appropriately in the boardroom. Um, sounds a bit like The Apprentice, but anyway, in this room we have climate change. We have Ravi Gurumurthy who will do this, but Ravi is very happy if none of you want to come because he basically wants to go for the growth discussion. But if you'd like to talk about climate change, Ravi, who's director of strategy at the Department of Energy and Climate Change, will come here. In that room, we have a double act of David Knott and Katrina Lang, um, who will talk about international development and poverty reduction. If you want to talk about that, they'll be in the innovation room over that side. Uh, Tom Aldred, who was asked the question about the riots, has a chance to talk about the glass. Tom, if you'd like to lead a bit of a discussion about cities and regeneration. Out on the landing and nearest to the drinks, we have Oric Gal, who asked a question earlier, is going to talk about national security. And there's some very difficult questions Eric's given about that, but you can talk about other things as well. And then Adrian Brown, uh, who worked on any number of public service reform white papers, uh, will talk to you about does any of this have any application to public services, and he's going to be on the other side of the landing. Does anyone think, actually, I really want to talk about... I keep on trying to get the IFG to discuss the Eurozone, but for us, Europe doesn't exist, which means we feel so much happier in our basic minds. If anyone wants to talk about anything else, uh, offer up. We can supply you with notes and whiteboards. Anyway, so if you are up for a bit of discussion uh, and networking over drinks and just trying that, let's see what happens. It always looks like your agent-based modeling as everybody goes there to get a drink and then comes back. Uh, we'll try and allocate some IFG people around. We were going to say let's all come back and discuss, but actually... I think let's not do that. Let's, Eric will roam around and talk to you and see. So it's a chance just to discuss, does any of this actually help you think about things in a bit differently? But we will have some IFG people to try and capture some of that thinking and feedback to us. And of course, Mike Hallsworth will be lurking around and telling you all how to be system stewards everywhere. But before we do that, let's just thank Eric for a terrific tour de force talk. And for any colleagues of yours who failed to come, um, we will try and put it on the website. But as you might have spotted, there might be a bit of a problem with the audio levels in the, uh, in the first section of the talk because of the microphone issue. Um, so we hope it's okay. But actually, I think Eric is actually all over YouTube. <laughs> so um, if you can't find Eric here, you'll find Eric at the, you know, whatever the reverse Bretton Woods conference was off and things like that. So there's a lot of Eric around. So anyway. Uh, so go and get a, go have a drink and come and discuss if you want to. If you don't, you're allowed to just party as well.